The Mysterious Traveller by Maurice LeBlanc The evening before, I had sent my automobile to Rouen by the highway. I was to travel to Rouen by rail, on my way to visit some friends that live on the banks of the Seine. At Paris, a few minutes before the train started, seven gentlemen entered my compartment, five of them were smoking. No matter that the journey was a short one, the thought of travelling with such a company was not agreeable to me, especially as the car was built on the old model, without a corridor. I picked up my overcoat, my newspapers and my timetable, and sought refuge in a neighbouring compartment. It was occupied by a lady, who, at sight of me, made a gesture of annoyance that did not escape my notice, and she leaned toward a gentleman who was standing on the step and was, no doubt, her husband. The gentleman scrutinized me closely, and, apparently, my appearance did not displease him, for he smiled as he spoke to his wife with the air of one who reassures a frightened child. She smiled also, and gave me a friendly glance as if she now understood that I was one of those gallant men with whom a woman can remain shut up for two hours in a little box, six feet square, and have nothing to fear. Her husband said to her, I have an important appointment, my dear, and cannot wait any longer. Adieu. He kissed her affectionately and went away. His wife threw him a few kisses and waved her handkerchief. The whistle sounded, and the train started. At that precise moment, and despite the protests of the guards, the door was opened, and a man rushed into our compartment. My companion, who was standing and arranging her luggage, uttered a cry of terror and fell upon the seat. I am not a coward far from it but I confess that such intrusions at the last minute are always disconcerting. They have a suspicious, unnatural aspect. However, the appearance of the new arrival greatly modified the unfavorable impression produced by his precipitant action. He was correctly and elegantly dressed, wore a tasteful cravat, correct gloves, and his face was refined and intelligent. But, where the devil had I seen that face before? Because, beyond all possible doubt, I had seen it. And yet the memory of it was so vague and indistinct that I felt it would be useless to try to recall it at that time. Then, directing my attention to the lady, I was amazed at the pallor and anxiety I saw in her face. She was looking at her neighbour they occupied seats on the same side of the compartment with an expression of intense alarm, and I perceived that one of her trembling hands was slowly gliding toward a little travelling bag that was lying on the seat about twenty inches from her. She finished by seizing it and nervously drawing it to her. Our eyes met, and I read in hers so much anxiety and fear that I could not refrain from speaking to her, Are you ill, madam? Shall I open the window? Her only reply was a gesture indicating that she was afraid of our companion. I smiled, as her husband had done, shrugged my shoulders, and explained to her, in pantomime, that she had nothing to fear, that I was there, and, besides, the gentleman appeared to be a very harmless individual. At that moment, he turned toward us, scrutinized both of us from head to foot, then settled down in his corner and paid us no more attention. After a short silence, the lady, as if she had mustered all her energy to perform a desperate act, said to me, in an almost inaudible voice, Do you know who is on our train? Who? He. He, I assure you, who is he? Arsène Lupin. She had not taken her eyes off our companion, and it was to him rather than to me that she uttered the syllables of that disquieting name. He drew his hat over his face. Was that to conceal his agitation or, simply, to arrange himself for sleep? Then I said to her, yesterday, through contumacy, Arsène Lupin was sentenced to twenty years' imprisonment at hard labor. 
Therefore it is improbable that he would be so imprudent, today, as to show himself in public. Moreover, the newspapers have announced his appearance in Turkey since his escape from the Santi. But he is on this train at the present moment the lady proclaimed, with the obvious intention of being heard by our companion, my husband is one of the directors in the penitentiary service, and it was the station master himself who told us that a search was being made for Arsene Lupin. They may have been mistaken no, he was seen in the waiting room. He bought a first-class ticket for Rouen. He has disappeared. The guard at the waiting room door did not see him pass, and it is supposed that he had got into the express that leaves ten minutes after us. In that case, they will be sure to catch him. Unless, at the last moment, he leaped from that train to come here, into our train. Which is quite probable. Which is almost certain. If so, he will be arrested just the same, for the employees and guards would no doubt observe his passage from one train to the other, and, when we arrive at Ruang, they will arrest him there. Him never. He will find some means of escape. In that case, I wish him bon voyage. But, in the meantime, think what he may do. What? I don't know. He may do anything. She was greatly agitated, and, truly, the situation justified, to some extent, her nervous excitement. I was impelled to say to her, of course, there are many strange coincidences, but you need have no fear. Admitting that Arsene Lupin is on this train, he will not commit any indiscretion, he will be only too happy to escape the peril that already threatens him. My words did not reassure her, but she remained silent for a time. I unfolded my newspapers and read reports of Arsene Lupin's trial, but, as they contained nothing that was new to me, I was not greatly interested. Moreover, I was tired and sleepy. I felt my eyelids close and my head drop. But, monsieur, you are not going to sleep. She seized my newspaper, and looked at me with indignation. Certainly not, I said. That would be very imprudent. Of course I assented. I struggled to keep awake. I looked through the window at the landscape and the fleeting clouds, but in a short time all that became confused and indistinct, the image of the nervous lady and the drowsy gentleman were effaced from my memory, and I was buried in the soothing depths of a profound sleep. The tranquility of my response was soon disturbed by disquieting dreams, wherein a creature that had played the part and bore the name of Arsène Lupin held an important place. He appeared to me with his back laden with articles of value, he leaped over walls, and plundered castles. But the outlines of that creature, who was no longer Arsène Lupin, assumed a more definite form. He came toward me, growing larger and larger, leaped into the compartment with incredible agility, and landed squarely on my chest. With a cry of fright and pain, I awoke. The man, the traveller, our companion, with his knee on my breast, held me by the throat. My sight was very indistinct, for my eyes were suffused with blood. I could see the lady, in a corner of the compartment, convulsed with fright. I tried even not to resist. Besides, I did not have the strength. My temples throbbed, I was almost strangled. One minute more, and I would have breathed my last. The man must have realized it, for he relaxed his grip, but did not remove his hand. Then he took a cord, in which he had prepared a slip knot, and tied my wrists together. In an instant, I was bound, gagged, and helpless. Certainly, he accomplished the trick with an ease and skill that revealed the hand of a master, he was, no doubt, a professional thief. 
not a word, not a nervous movement, only coolness and audacity. And I was there, lying on the bench, bound like a mummy, I Arsene Lupin. It was anything but a laughing matter, and yet, despite the gravity of the situation, I keenly appreciated the humour and irony that it involved. Arsene Lupin seized and bound like a novice. Robbed as if I were an unsophisticated rustic for, you must understand, the scoundrel had deprived me of my purse and wallet. Arsene Lupin, a victim, duped, vanquished, what an adventure. The lady did not move. He did not even notice her. He contented himself with picking up her travelling bag that had fallen to the floor and taking from it the jewels, purse, and gold and silver trinkets that it contained. The lady opened her eyes, trembled with fear, drew the rings from her fingers and handed them to the man as if she wished to spare him unnecessary trouble. He took the rings and looked at her. She swooned. Then, quite unruffled, he resumed his seat, lighted a cigarette, and proceeded to examine the treasure that he had acquired. The examination appeared to give him perfect satisfaction. But I was not so well satisfied. I do not speak of the twelve thousand francs of which I had been unduly deprived, that was only a temporary loss, because I was certain that I would recover possession of that money after a very brief delay, together with the important papers contained in my wallet, plans, specifications, addresses, lists of correspondence, and compromising letters. But, for the moment, a more immediate and more serious question troubled me, how would this affair end? What would be the outcome of this adventure? As you can imagine, the disturbance created by my passage through the saint Lazare station has not escaped my notice. Going to visit friends who knew me under the name of Guillaume Balat, and amongst whom my resemblance to Arsène Lupin was a subject of many innocent jests, I could not assume a disguise, and my presence had been remarked. So, beyond question, the commissary of police at Rouen, notified by telegraph, and assisted by numerous agents, would be awaiting the train, would question all suspicious passengers, and proceed to search the cars. Of course, I had foreseen all that, but it had not disturbed me, as I was certain that the police of Rouen would not be any shrewder than the police of Paris and that I could escape recognition, would it not be sufficient for me to carelessly display my card as depute thanks to which I had inspired complete confidence in the gatekeeper at saint Lazare? but the situation was greatly changed. I was no longer free. It was impossible to attempt one of my usual tricks. In one of the compartments, the commissary of police would find Monday Arsène Lupin, bound hand and foot, as docile as a lamb, packed up, all ready to be dumped into a prison van. He would have simply to accept delivery of the parcel, the same as if it were so much merchandise or a basket of fruit and vegetables. Yet, to avoid that shameful dinament, what could I do, bound and gagged, as I was? And the train was rushing on toward Rouen, the next and only station. Another problem was presented, in which I was less interested, but the solution of which aroused my professional curiosity. What were the intentions of my rascally companion? Of course, if I had been alone, he could, on our arrival at Rouen, leave the car slowly and fearlessly. But the lady? As soon as the door of the compartment should be opened, the lady, now so quiet and humble, would scream and call for help. That was the dilemma that perplexed me. Why had he not reduced her to a helpless condition similar to mine? That would have given him ample time to disappear before his double crime was discovered. He was still smoking, with his eyes fixed upon the window that was now being streaked with drops of rain. Once he turned, picked up my timetable, and consulted it. 
The lady had to feign a continued lack of consciousness in order to deceive the enemy. But fits of coughing, provoked by the smoke, exposed her true condition. As to me, I was very uncomfortable, and very tired. And I meditated, I plotted. The train was rushing on, joyously, intoxicated with its own speed. Saint Etienne, at that moment, the man arose and took two steps toward us, which caused the lady to utter a cry of alarm and fall into a genuine swoon. What was the man about to do? He lowered the window on our side. A heavy rain was now falling, and, by a gesture, the man expressed his annoyance at his not having an umbrella or an overcoat. He glanced at the rack. The lady's umbrella was there. He took it. He also took my overcoat and put it on. We were now crossing the Seine. He turned up the bottoms of his trousers, then leaned over and raised the exterior latch of the door. Was he going to throw himself upon the track? At that speed, it would have been instant death. We now entered a tunnel. The man opened the door halfway and stood on the upper step. What folly! The darkness, the smoke, the noise, all gave a fantastic appearance to his actions. But suddenly, the train diminished its speed. A moment later it increased its speed, then slowed up again. Probably, some repairs were being made in that part of the tunnel which obliged the trains to diminish their speed, and the man was aware of the fact. He immediately stepped down to the lower step, closed the door behind him, and leaped to the ground. He was gone. The lady immediately recovered her wits, and her first act was to lament the loss of her jewels. I gave her an imploring look. She understood, and quickly removed the gag that stifled me. She wished to untie the cords that bound me, but I prevented her. No, no, the police must see everything exactly as it stands. I want them to see what the rascal did to us. Suppose I pull the alarm bell? Too late. You should have done that when he made the attack on me. But he would have killed me. Ah. Monsieur, didn't I tell you that he was on this train? I recognized him from his portrait. And now he has gone off with my jewels. Don't worry. The police will catch him. Catch Arsène Lupin? Never. That depends on you, madam. Listen. When we arrive at Ruang, be at the door and call. Make a noise. The police and the railway employees will come. Tell what you have seen, the assault made on me and the flight of Arsène Lupin. Give a description of him soft hat, umbrella yours grey overcoat, yours said she. What, mine? Not at all. It was his. I didn't have any. It seems to me he didn't have one when he came in. Yes, yes. Unless the coat was one that someone had forgotten and left in the rack. At all events, he had it when he went away, and that is the essential point. A grey overcoat remember, ah. I forgot. You must tell your name, first thing you do. Your husband's official position will stimulate the zeal of the police. We arrived at the station. I gave her some further instructions in a rather imperious tone, tell them my name be Yom Balat. If necessary, say that you know me. That will save time. We must expedite the preliminary investigation. The important thing is the pursuit of Arsène Lupin. Your jewels, remember. Let there be no mistake. Guillaume Vallat, a friend of your husband. I understand, Guillaume Vallat. She was already calling and gesticulating. 
As soon as the train stopped, several men entered the compartment. The critical moment had come. Panting for breath, the lady exclaimed, Arsene Lupin. He attacked us. He stole my jewels, I am Madame Renault. My husband is a director of the penitentiary service, ah. Here is my brother, Georges Ardell, director of the Credit Rouenais. You must know, she embraced a young man who had just joined us, and whom the commissary saluted. Then she continued, weeping, yes, Arsène Lupin. While Monsieur was sleeping, he seized him by the throat, Monday Balat, a friend of my husband. The commissary asked, but where is Arsène Lupin? He leaped from the train, when passing through the tunnel. Are you sure that it was he? Am I sure? I recognized him perfectly. Besides, he was seen at the saint Lazare station. He wore a soft hat no, a hard felt, like that said the commissary, pointing to my hat. He had a soft hat, I am sure repeated Madame Renault, and a grey overcoat. Yes, that is right replied the commissary, the telegram says he wore a grey overcoat with a black velvet collar. Exactly, a black velvet collar exclaimed Madame Renault, triumphantly. I breathed freely. Ah! The excellent friend I had in that little woman. The police agents had now released me. I bit my lips until they ran blood. Stooping over, with my handkerchief over my mouth, an attitude quite natural in a person who has remained for a long time in an uncomfortable position, and whose mouth shows the bloody marks of the gag, I addressed the commissary, in a weak voice, Monsieur, it was Arsène Lupin. There is no doubt about that. If we make haste, he can be caught yet. I think I may be of some service to you. The railway car, in which the crime occurred, was detached from the train to serve as a mute witness at the official investigation. The train continued on its way to Havre. We were then conducted to the station master's office through a crowd of curious spectators. Then, I had a sudden access of doubt and discretion. Under some pretext or other, I must gain my automobile and escape. To remain there was dangerous. Something might happen, for instance, a telegram from Paris, and I would be lost. Yes, but what about my thief? Abandoned to my own resources, in an unfamiliar country, I could not hope to catch him. Bah! I must make the attempt I said to myself. It may be a difficult game, but an amusing one, and the stake is well worth the trouble. And when the commissary asked us to repeat the story of the robbery, I exclaimed, Monsieur, really, Arsène Lupin is getting the start of us. My automobile is waiting in the courtyard. If you will be so kind as to use it, we can try, the commissary smiled, and replied, the idea is a good one, so good, indeed, that it is already being carried out. Two of my men have set out on bicycles. They have been gone for some time. Where did they go? To the entrance of the tunnel. There, they will gather evidence, secure witnesses, and follow on the track of Arsène Lupin. I could not refrain from shrugging my shoulders, as I replied, your men will not secure any evidence or any witnesses. Really? Arsène Lupin will not allow anyone to see him emerge from the tunnel. He will take the first road to Rouen, where we will arrest him. He will not go to Rouen. Then he will remain in the vicinity, where his capture will be even more certain. He will not remain in the vicinity. Oh, oh. And where will he hide? I looked at my watch, and said, at the present moment, Arsène Lupin is prowling around the station at Darnatal. 
At 10.50, that is, in 22 minutes from now, he will take the train that goes from Rouen to Amiens. Do you think so? How do you know it? Oh, it is quite simple. While we were in the car, Arsène Lupin consulted my railway guide. Why did he do it? Was there, not far from the spot where he disappeared, another line of railway, a station upon that line, and a train stopping at that station? On consulting my railway guide, I found such to be the case. Really, monsieur said the commissary, that is a marvellous deduction. I congratulate you on your skill. I was now convinced that I had made a mistake in displaying so much cleverness. The commissary regarded me with astonishment, and I thought a slight suspicion entered his official mind, oh. Scarcely that, for the photographs distributed broadcast by the police department were too imperfect, they presented an Arsène Lupin so different from the one he had before him, that he could not possibly recognize me by it. But, all the same, he was troubled, confused and ill at ease. Mondayu, nothing stimulates the comprehension so much as the loss of a pocketbook and the desire to recover it. And it seems to me that if you will give me two of your men, we may be able, oh. I beg of you, Monsieur le Commissaire cried Madame Renault, listen to Monday Balat. The intervention of my excellent friend was decisive. Pronounced by her, the wife of an influential official, the name of Balat became really my own, and gave me an identity that no mere suspicion could affect. The commissary arose, and said, Believe me, Monsieur Balat, I shall be delighted to see you succeed. I am as much interested as you are in the arrest of Arsène Lupin. He accompanied me to the automobile, and introduced two of his men, Anna Massol and Gaston Delivet, who were assigned to assist me. My chauffeur cranked up the car and I took my place at the wheel. A few seconds later, we left the station. I was saved. Ah! I must confess that in rolling over the boulevards that surrounded the old Norman city, in my swift 35 horsepower Mora Lepton, I experienced a deep feeling of pride, and the motor responded, sympathetically to my desires. At right and left, the trees flew past us with startling rapidity, and I, free, out of danger, had simply to arrange my little personal affairs with the two honest representatives of the Rouen police who were sitting behind me. Arsène Lupin was going in search of Arsène Lupin. Modest guardians of social order Gaston Delivet and Arna Massol how valuable was your assistance? What would I have done without you? Without you, many times, at the crossroads, I might have taken the wrong route. Without you, Arsène Lupin would have made a mistake, and the other would have escaped. But the end was not yet. Far from it. I had yet to capture the thief and recover the stolen papers. Under no circumstances must my two acolytes be permitted to see those papers, much less to seize them. That was a point that might give me some difficulty. We arrived at Darnetal three minutes after the departure of the train. True, I had the consolation of learning that a man wearing a grey overcoat with a black velvet collar had taken the train at the station. He had bought a second-class ticket for Amiens. Certainly, my debut as detective was a promising one. Delivet said to me, the train is express, and the next stop is Monteroliabuchi in 19 minutes. If we do not reach there before Arsène Lupin, he can proceed to Amiens, or change for the train going to Claire's, and, from that point, reach Dieppe or Paris. How far to Monterolia? 23 kilometres. 23 kilometres in 19 minutes, we will be there ahead of him. We were off again.
Never had my faith fall more erect and responded to my impatience with such ardour and regularity. It participated in my anxiety. It endorsed my determination. It comprehended my animosity against that rascally Arsene Lupin. The knave. The traitor. Turn to the right cried delivered, then to the left. We fairly flew, scarcely touching the ground. The milestones looked like little timid beasts that vanished at our approach. Suddenly, at a turn of the road, we saw a vortex of smoke. It was the Northern Express. For a kilometre, it was a struggle, side by side, but an unequal struggle in which the issue was certain. We won the race by twenty lengths. In three seconds we were on the platform standing before the second-class carriages. The doors were opened, and some passengers alighted, but not my thief. We made a search through the compartments. No sign of Arsene Lupin. Sapristi! I cried, he must have recognised me in the automobile as we were racing, side by side, and he leaped from the train. Ah, there he is now, crossing the track. I started in pursuit of the man, followed by my two acolytes, or rather followed by one of them, for the other, Massol, proved himself to be a runner of exceptional speed and endurance. In a few moments, he had made an appreciable gain upon the fugitive. The man noticed it, leaped over a hedge, scampered across a meadow, and entered a thick grove. When we reached this grove, Massol was waiting for us. He went no farther, for fear of losing us. Quite right, my dear friend, I said. After such a run, our victim must be out of wind. We will catch him now. I examined the surroundings with the idea of proceeding alone in the arrest of the fugitive, in order to recover my papers, concerning which the authorities would doubtless ask many disagreeable questions. Then I returned to my companions, and said, It is all quite easy. You, Massol, take your place at the left, you, Delivet, at the right. From there, you can observe the entire posterior line of the bush, and he cannot escape without you seeing him, except by that ravine, and I shall watch it. If he does not come out voluntarily, I will enter and drive him out toward one or the other of you. You have simply to wait. Ah! I forgot, in case I need you, a pistol shot. Massol and Delivet walked away to their respective posts. As soon as they had disappeared, I entered the grove with the greatest precaution so as to be neither seen nor heard. I encountered dense thickets, through which narrow paths had been cut, but the overhanging boughs compelled me to adopt a stooping posture. One of these paths led to a clearing in which I found footsteps upon the wet grass. I followed them, they led me to the foot of a mound which was surmounted by a deserted, dilapidated hovel. He must be there I said to myself. It is a well-chosen retreat. I crept cautiously to the side of the building. A slight noise informed me that he was there, and, then, through an opening, I saw him. His back was turned toward me. In two bounds, I was upon him. He tried to fire a revolver that he held in his hand. But he had no time. I threw him to the ground, in such a manner that his arms were beneath him, twisted and helpless, whilst I held him down with my knee on his breast. Listen, my boy, I whispered in his ear. I am Arsene Lupin. You are to deliver over to me, immediately and gracefully, my pocketbook and the lady's jewels, and, in return therefore, I will save you from the police and enrol you amongst my friends. One word, yes or no? Yes, he murmured. Very good. Your escape, this morning, was well planned. 
I congratulate you. I arose. He fumbled in his pocket, drew out a large knife and tried to strike me with it. Imbecile! I exclaimed. With one hand, I parried the attack, with the other, I gave him a sharp blow on the carotid artery. He fell stunned. In my pocketbook, I recovered my papers and bank notes. Out of curiosity, I took his. Upon an envelope, addressed to him, I read his name, Pierre Onfrey. It startled me. Pierre Onfrey, the assassin of the Rue Lafontaine at Autouille. Pierre Onfrey, he who had cut the throats of Madame Delbois and her two daughters. I leaned over him. Yes, those were the features which, in the compartment, had evoked in me the memory of a face I could not then recall. The time was passing. I placed in an envelope two banknotes of 100 francs each, with a card bearing these words, Arsène Lupin to his worthy colleagues Arna Massol and Gaston Delivet, as a slight token of his gratitude. I placed it in a prominent spot in the room, where they would be sure to find it. Beside it, I placed Madame Renault's handbag. Why could I not return it to the lady who had befriended me? I must confess that I had taken from it everything that possessed any interest or value, leaving there only a shell comb, a stick of rouge dorine for the lips, and an empty purse. But, you know, business is business. And then, really, her husband is engaged in such a dishonorable vocation. The man was becoming conscious. What was I to do? I was unable to save him or condemn him. So I took his revolver and fired a shot in the air. My two acolytes will come and attend to his case I said to myself, as I hastened away by the road through the ravine. Twenty minutes later, I was seated in my automobile. At four o'clock, I telegraphed to my friends at Ruang that an unexpected event would prevent me from making my promised visit. Between ourselves, considering what my friends must now know, my visit is postponed indefinitely. A cruel disillusion for them. At six o'clock I was in Paris. The evening newspapers informed me that Pierre Onfrey had been captured at last. Next day let us not despise the advantages of judicious advertising the Echo de France published this sensational item, Yesterday, near Bucci, after numerous exciting incidents, Arsène Lupin effected the arrest of Pierre Onfray. The assassin of the Rue Lafontaine had robbed Madame Renault, wife of the director in the penitentiary service, in a railway carriage on the Paris Havre line. Arsène Lupin restored to Madame Renault the handbag that contained her jewels, and gave a generous recompense to the two detectives who had assisted him in making that dramatic arrest.